Okay, so take a drive and then download lab seven. We didn't finish that last time, so I'll walk you through it. So hopefully we can tackle that within the next 30 minutes. And if for some reason your virtual machine doesn't work, you can work with someone else next to you or you can create your virtual machine again. And, and we, we did that last time. Okay. So I think we left off with after installing Kane. Um, now, for, if for some reason, if Kane icon disappeared from your desktop, it's because your antivirus got activated again. You can either re-download it and reinstall it, or you can go to your antivirus um, configuration, okay? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that we have these users, and some of you have done this part already. So if you are using Windows 10 Pro, you would see that um, you would be able to have computer management console with the local user account, okay? Let me enable live transcript real quick so I have the file. All right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and right click here. So where I'm at is I'm gonna pick up at um, this step right here, which is for part B, okay? Step five of part B. So here's my Windows 10, okay? Now we turn off our firewall already, but the antivirus sometimes it picks up your your cane threat as a threat. So um, we are we can reinstall it or we can configure the virus antivirus. Okay. So I right click my Windows button and I'm gonna go to Computer Management Console. Okay. And I should have upped this. So if you are booting your Windows, you might want to up your RAM to like more than than four maybe four gigs it's going to be faster because two gigs is like the minimal for the os so as you open up your computer management console you are going to see this okay and here is your local users and groups so if you're missing that it's because you're using the wrong version of windows 10 then you can work with someone next to you, okay? Now, on the instruction, it tells you to click the users folder. So we're gonna go here and you can right click anywhere on the, the right pane and you can make new user. And on the instruction, it tells you that you are going to make two user accounts. One is gonna be a test one where we want to only use three character for password, one, two, three. Okay, we want it to brute force the password, so we want to make sure that it's short enough that it can give you back in, this, in, in a certain amount of time. Then we are going to make a second user that's called test2, and you're going to increase the password length to five characters, okay, to two tests. So here I am on my Windows 10. I right-click my Windows button, and I went to Computer Management Console. Then I click on the local user and groups and then the user folder. And so I can right click here and I'm gonna make a new user, okay? So since I already have test one and test two on there, I'm gonna call my user something else, okay? So I'm gonna call it test three. You can name it anything you want. And then the password, we're gonna do one, two, three and one, two, three, okay? And then I'm, I usually disable this if it's just a test user but you can leave that on because we're not logging on to that user anytime right now. So you're gonna click create. And then another one, we are gonna call it test two, but I'm gonna do test four. And then I'm gonna do two tests is the password to test and click create. Now it's not gonna be effective until you close it. So once you do that, you have the user account shown there. Okay, so at that step, we are at part B of lab seven. We completed from five to 10. We're here, okay? 
Now we are gonna close the management console and then we're gonna use Kane. So after that, we're gonna close this. Now, if you don't have your Kane here, there's several ways that you can find it, right? If it's quarantine, it you need to go to antivirus, so Windows Defender. So I normally type in virus to search. And then I want to make sure that I go here. So when you go there, it's going to show, you can click on manage settings, okay, make sure things are off, but it will tell you a list of quarantine or not, like the certain files that could be threat. Okay, you should see like a list and it would say like a setup, whatever, that's your application file. So it's also there. But once you install it, where well, this is where you're going to find your application, you are going to open up your folder. Okay, if it's not on your desktop, you're going to go to this PC. It's under C drive, x86 folder, and Kane is there. Okay, so when you go here, you would see the Kane option, and that's your executable. So if your desktop icon disappear, you're going to go to C drive, program files, x86, and Kane folder, and you will find Kane executable there. Okay. All right. So after we open up Kane, it's going to prompt you this. You're going to click yes to allow. Okay. And this is the application. So at this step, what I did was I opened up my Kane. And then the next step is is step 13. I'm gonna click on the cracker option because there are many different tools within Kane. And you are going to click on the LM and TLM. And we talked about this in the lecture last time. These are the hash type that Windows used to store to encrypt the password. So what Kane gonna do is it's gonna crack the hash. And with that, we're able to decrypt the password, okay? So here I am. I'm going to go ahead and click on cracker, which is with the key like this. And you can pull the pane a little bit to the right so you can see everything. Then I'm going to click this right here, make sure I select it. And then the next step, I, after I select the NTLM, I'm going to click the plus button at the top. And I'm going to check click the checkbox for include password hashes history okay so coming back here i click on cracker ntlm and then i click the blue plus sign at the top make sure i check this box okay now you're using a word list that's built into the application so if you want more of a comprehensive word list then you would need to import that in as a text file you can generate your word list in Linux using Crunch, but you you there are tons of word lists that are out there. If you go to like a uh, you know Burp uh, repository, you'll find word lists. There are a lot of different type of word lists. So what it is, it's a file that contains your normal common password, like one two three four five, password one, those things, right? So it's going to use that list to to match your password, okay? So where I'm at right here is after I click the plus sign and include the hash history, I'm going to write, it's, it's, we're going to go ahead and click next. Okay. And it's going to generate it, right? Right now, it doesn't see anything yet. Okay. So what we're going to do, oh, oh, I'm getting an error. Start able service. Okay, let's see. Then you're gonna right click one of the user accounts. So I'm gonna do test three. You guys can use test one. Okay. So as you right click that, what you're gonna do is you are going to um, choose brute force attack and NTLM hashes. That's the option. So you're gonna do brute force attack, right? And NTLM hashes. You don't need to do the challenge one. Okay. And then you're going to click start. So it's really quick with the three characters that are numerical value. 
it takes like less than a second. Okay. So it tells me here that it cracked one hash. Okay. And it is, you know, it starts with one, two, three. So when you brute force, it's just trying different values. So one, two, three is like at the beginning of your value or your character sets. So it, it plugged that in here. So it already cracked that password. You see that? Okay. Now, if I choose the next user and I right click and I do the same thing again, brute force, and I use the NTLM hash. Okay. And I just click start. Remember this one has five characters. So it's going to run a little longer. Okay. Normally that would be like, you know, see on here, it tells me it's two tests and it's a few seconds. So when you increase the character length, you will find that it's going to take a little bit longer to brute force, depending on whether your password is complex or not. Okay. All right. So if you just join us, we're on part B and we just went through the step. Redownload the lab seven file. Okay. So we did that here. And when you look at your report, after you finish this, you can click exit. And it shows you here. So you can do that for every single user. But when the user has eight or more characters, it's going to take hours, right? Longer or even months sometimes if it's very complex. Okay, any question? So that's how you use cane to crack and it, crack at the, it cracks using hash. Now on the left side, you would see that there are many different type, right, that we can use if you're using database you would you know you can look at these if you're using other hashes like md5 or cisco based stuff you can use these so the the latest version of cane even though they stopped supporting it it has more functionality than what you've seen in the older older version okay so some of you have done this so at this point what you're going to do is you are going to answer this question how many hashes were cracked right if you only did one user, there should be only one hash that's cracked. It tells you how many and, and when it stopped, okay? Then you need to answer that question. Did the program display the password in plain text? It should if it cracked it. Is the password accurate? Was it the same, the password that you said? It should be, right? So when I look at my cane, after I right click the user and do brute force and NTLM and it cracked it, it tells me this is my password to test and one, two, three for the other user. Okay. Now, if, if there is no password on a certain account, right, it would, after you try to crack it, it's going to tell you there's no password. Any question regarding brute force using hash crack? In Kane? All right, so make sure we answer these questions. We are gonna do the same thing for, for both accounts. Take a screen capture. Okay, so what do I capture? I captured this, showing my passwords, okay? All right, then it asks you how long did the system take to brute force the, the, the test two account. It should be a few seconds, right? It tells you the time elapsed there, but keep in mind that Kane doesn't give you the actual real time. So when you crack the password, sometimes it might be hours or years or whatever, right? If it's very long, it will tell you the estimated time and when it found it. So the more, the more advanced your word list is, the faster it's going to be. So what they do is they would have a really good word list, but sometimes that can be a very large file. Okay. All right. So answer these questions. So next we are going to do a crypto analysis one. I'm just going to have you configure it, but you know, this is a, the beginning step of your rainbow attack. So a rainbow table is a pre-computed table that's used for hash functions in encryption. This is used to crack passwords. So instead of using individual word lists, we can make a table and it will correlate 
right, based on the content of that. So usually this is done for password cracking. So in recovering plain, plain text password, we can consider, right, a larger length because when you're using the normal cane cracker that can impose limitation. So more on the more complex password, a risk analysis person would use rainbow attack. Okay, and in cane, you have that functionality. So where do I find this application? You are going to go to WinRTGen. So in your windows, open up your file manager, go to C drive, open up program files under cane folder. Okay, and then you are going to scroll down. I'm sorry. It's at the top. Uh, go to the second folder from the top, and then you are going to click on where it says application, which is your EXE. So Kane is a toolkit where it consists of different small applications, right? So it's gonna look like this, okay? So follow the path by going to that particular folder and then open up the application. It says application net in, in the type. Then after I have the application open, I'm gonna click add table and then you can choose the type of hash that you want. So here, this is my, my, my uh, option for, for, for rainbow attack. I'm gonna go ahead and click add table. And this is where you select your hash, right? So let's say that I just use the default one, which is the first one on the list. I can select that. Or if you are using MD5, which is very common for software, then you can select MD5. Then your maximum length character, we can put 12. Okay? Because on the more complex password, we want to crack the longer password. Then um, after we have put in our 12 characters, you are going to click OK. OK. And then OK again. And what it's going to do is going to generate, and this is going to take a little bit. OK. So if you want to stop it, you can click the stop. So you can let that run for a little bit, just let it run in the background. And when you when you finish, if you are able to get the success probability, it's gonna show you on the on the on the actual prompt, the application prompt or window. Any question? So I'm only showing you some of the features on Kane. Right, um, you can explore other things. We are limited to, you know, the the things here. But it's always good to scan our own system, or you know, you can put another server up on your network and scan it. Okay. So next, we're gonna talk about the other scanners. Okay. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to find our own IP address so we can scan against it, or we can use a loopback address. So. Mm -hmm. So you can let this run, right? Um, you know, next we are gonna do the next part, which is part, part C, it should be part C. I forgot to fix this. All right, so here I'm gonna go to my Windows VM search bar and I'm gonna open up my command prompt by typing in CMD. Then on command prompt, I simply do IP config space last all to find all the IP information. So it's going to give you the IP address where it's just preferred. That's going to be your IPv4. So in my case, it is 10.0.2.15. We're on NAT configuration for the virtual box. So that's your private address for your virtual machine. Okay. 
at home, if you run this, it would say 192.168. Whatever. Or if you set it to be a certain IP, it will be that. Okay. So for me, I'm going to go ahead and write down that address. And you would do the same for yours. Then coming back to Arcane, even if we have the rainbow table working, coming back here, you're going to go ahead and click on, um, I have you click on the network tab. So what you can do is on the network configuration, you can add in a list of IP addresses that will be your target. Okay, so if I'm I'm an, uh, an analyst that's looking to assess, let's say five servers, I can add in those IP addresses here. So you are gonna click the add button and then you are gonna type in the IP and click okay. And what we can do is we can also add in another IP address, which is our own loopback address. So if you don't know your IP, you can use the loopback address, which is 127.0.0.1. And that address, the system always call home, it calls itself. Okay, click okay. So how do I know which IP address was added? If you click on the quick list, it shows all the IP addresses. See how I add the 127 twice? It shows up there twice. So on this application, it cannot differentiate between the same address and a different address. So when you're using this, just keep in mind that if, if so considering that I can scan that target many times, I can go in and I can add the addresses here. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a group of systems that will be considered part of the network. And I can use like sniffer, trace route and different things to scan it, okay? So after you add your IP, you're gonna click on the quick list. You're gonna take a screen capture. It would look something like this with one less, okay? So you might have many, when you do this real life, you might have 10, 100, 1,000. So in the case of 1,000, you want to use an application that you can import in a list of IP address from a .txt file, okay? Or do a range instead of just individual add of IP. Okay, so after we have that, take a screen capture. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at wireless adapter. And I took out some of the steps on this because um, the older version has different interface. So we are gonna go ahead and click on Arcane again. Okay. And then we're gonna do wireless. Now here, if you select this, you should see a second option. Do you guys have a second option? When you click the wireless tab, you click the drop down arrow where it says active scan. There should be a MAC address there. Okay. And then we are going to, after you select the second option, I forgot a step, Let's see? All right. Oh, yeah, it's not gonna handle that anyway. Gonna go ahead and click on sniffer. And what we're gonna do is we are going to set up an art poison test, okay? So click the plus sign. Oh, why is it not activated? Oh, okay, so far, oh, sorry, go ahead and do configure. And then we are, we are going to, um, I don't want it to start at the startup though, let me see. See if it, it's gonna allow me to do this here. I 
ran this earlier. Oh, come on. Didn't obtain the client. I just ran it earlier. What the? <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's see. Uh, there's host. They are ARP. Okay. All right. So, okay, here's what we're going to do. When you are on, on the sniffer portion, like where we were at, okay, click this, this ARP button or APR, and then click the plus sign. Here is where you can select your test. So we can do a multicast group. So when it says multicast, that just means that they are sent to, a, it's going to send to like a number of computers, not everyone. Now, if you do all tests, takes a long time. Okay, so you can set up different type of tests here. If you can do a broadcast test, or you can do a multicast test. So what's the difference? Broadcast just means that it's going to send to everybody that will be with using 8-bit where multicast is going to send to the smaller group. Okay, and there are different groups here. So I'm going to go ahead and select group zero. I think I have you guys do that. And then it's going to do this. Okay, so that's how you can do a range of system. And then you just wait and watch, right? So in this field, Normally, we run multiple virtual machines, and uh, when you do field testing, a lot of the times you have to, you should travel with at least a few, a couple powerful laptops. Sometimes the company supply that, sometimes you have to supply it as part of your contract. So what happens is it's going to scan like this, right? So it's looking at all the system that will be in those groups, and it's going to run the scan. And then when it finds it, it's going to place it on this table right here. And so that way you can have, you can write up your reports. Okay. So when we are scanning for address resolution protocol, it, because this can be vulnerable to different attacks, what we normally do is we would use that to be able to identify the type of system that would have some kind of risk impact. Remember, we talked about risk register. So you have to first start identifying the system and the level of impact of their risk. All right, any question? So you don't have to wait for that to complete. Just take a screen capture to show me that you're running that so I know that you know what to do. So what I did with that was when I was on Kane, I clicked this yellow icon and then I clicked the plus sign and I choose the multi -group, multicast group zero but you can select any type of test that you need. So I'm gonna go ahead and cancel this, okay? So now when you cancel, it just cancels subgroups. So you might have to click cancel multiple times. Now, when you come back here, right? If this is still running, that's fine. You can put down the percentage. This can go for a long time, okay? So you can hit stop on that too. Any question? So any type of, of scan that you do, the system logs it. So now we want to save that. So when you exit the program, sometimes it's going to tell you, do you want to save it? But Kane actually saves it to a certain location in the folder itself. Okay. So you should save your scan in case you need to go back, especially when you're doing analysis. Question. All right. Now, if you don't have your virtual machine on the next part, which is Zen map, you can probably do that on the regular machine. Yes. Question, Fonzo. Yeah. 
What does it say? Okay. Um, have you tried putting configure and then take put it into not uh, promiscuous mode? Yeah, don't use promiscuous mode. Try that. Usually that takes care of it. Hmm. It might be something with your, your WinPCAP file. So when you select that, can you click OK or it doesn't let you select that? Yeah, click OK, and then click this, right? You get a warning like this, yeah. click OK, and then click the plus sign, and then here's where you select. OK, you, when you click the plus sign, what does it say? Is it error? OK, just screenshot that for me. I got to see why that bug is there. Maybe we're missing something. So screen shut that. That's okay. I think I think that it, sometimes because of the the older and the newer version of the WinP cap, depending if you're using four point one versus one point six, right? I have to downgrade it to one point five and one point six, and it seems like it works better. So, in the case where you run into that, I think that what you can do is you can uh, when you install Nmap, you're gonna see that we can downgrade it to one point five. Even though it says that it's error, you can ignore the error and continue. And I think the because Kane is older, it works better with the, the driver files from the older WinP cap. Okay. All right. So we should be good with seven now, right? Everything. Um I highlighted this. Don't turn on your firewall because we're gonna do the next part. Just don't do 40 to the end. Just close cane enable app. Okay, so close cane and we are gonna go ahead and download our next one. Oh, yes. Okay, so open up your browser, which is Edge. We already have Windows 10 running. Now we're gonna do lap eight, okay? So make sure we download lap eight. We have an hour, so we should have enough time to get through it and, and I'll help people have questions. So um, Nmap is a very, 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 very popular tool, okay? If you ask any security professional, they know this, okay? Now, you have to be very versatile with Nmap to really use Nmap effectively. So I'm going to give you the cliff note version of it, because I have an hour with you. When you take the ethical hacking pen testing class, you might get more extensive training with Nmap, right? I use Nmap with Python scripting this week. And we you can do a lot more than just scanning ports. You can brute force all the servers, okay, at once. So it's a beautiful tool, okay? All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about this so you know what it is. Basically, it is a network mapper. And how we can map a network system is through their ports, like port 80 for HTTP and so on. The ports are tied with protocol, which are tied with services. So when you can identify what ports that system is open to, then we know what kind of services is on that system and how we can get there. Okay, so that means that when you're doing security audit, you need to make sure that you do an inventory of your systems ports. The ports that you don't use, you need to close it because that's where they come in. That's where the attacker can get in. Okay, because it ties to a service that could be vulnerable. So there are four types of ports when you're looking at ports. Number one, open. Those are the use 
open ports that are available for the services that's enabled. Filtered, that is firewall filtered ports. Often that when you see filtered, you know that that system has a firewall configuration. By default, at least Windows firewall. Close, disable ports, okay? Unfiltered, down here it says when, when it's probed because Nmap is an intrusive tool, it's gonna ping against the system. So there's no way, even when you do a stealth scan, the other system can pick you up. Firewall and security application, uh, firewall will pick you up. So on the unfiltered one, it's gonna probe and if it cannot determine between open or close, it's gonna put it in the unfiltered, okay? So make sure that we understand that. All right, so we already boot our Windows 10. I'm gonna go ahead and pick up at step seven, which is the download, okay? So on your Windows 10, open up your browser, which is Edge right here. Go to the URL bar and you can go to nmap.org slash download. And if and this is a versatile tool on any any platform. So if you're using Windows, which you are, you're gonna click on this or you can scroll down. Halfway down, you're gonna see this file, the exe. That's the setup file that you need. Okay. Now with that, any kind of network scanner, it's gonna use the NP tap. We saw that in Kane. Okay, you should also download this okay but if you don't it's going to use the 1.5 version with it so just like kane you got to install it and you got to install the driver so that way it can sniff out everything that's around it that's basically the 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 tool that you need to to initiate the drivers for your network interface card to sense other systems and connection around itself okay so once you download it, run the installation. Use the default configuration on it. So I wrote down the step for you, okay? Accept the license agreement, keep the same selections, go next, install, accept NPCAP license. So it's gonna prompt you that, right? And if it tells you that, oh, you already have a newer version, you can click ignore and continue. So it will put the 1.5 with the 4.13 that you have it there, or it's gonna try to uninstall the newer one. That's fine, okay? So follow the step that's there. I can't re reinstall it because I already have it installed when I tested this, okay? So after you install it, you would see the desktop icon. So on the GUI side, Okay, it's called ZenMap, but NMAP is the original application and it works beautifully in Linux. This was originally created in Linux or Unix system and they integrated the graphical user interface and wrote the code for all platform, Mac OS, Linux, Windows, and so on. Okay, so while you're doing that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about scripting on this because this tool is only effective if you know what you know what kind of scripts that you can use with it and this is why security always talk about you know people talk about scripting so So if you, if you visit their site, it's gonna look like this. You can always find reference by looking at their book. They actually wrote a digital book on there. And this is one of the application that is well, well documented, okay? So as you go through the installation, I'll wait for you to do that. So on here, you can find a lot of the details, but one of the things that you can search for is called NSE. And you will see this in the application. So NSE is an NMAP scripting engine. These are pre-made scripts that you can run in your NMAP. So NMAP is a scripting tool, okay? 
this is why if you use it in Linux, so if you go to the NSE scripts, there are thousands of them, okay? So we are gonna go to the libraries and I'll show you. So if I need a certain script, I go to the NSE library and I find it. Or if you run this directly in Linux, you just know which NSE that you need to use. So if I need to configure DHCP or scan DHCP, I can go and run that script. So developers already created these for you. So you just need to use it. And we're gonna see why when we scan, okay? Question. Okay, so there are lots and lots of script, including brute forcing, you know, server passwords and so on. Okay, so this is one of the, the areas that this tool, this tool really stand up. Okay. So after you finish the installation, you need to find your IP again. And if you have your IP address from the last time, you can put that down. And you also need to get your MAC address. Mine was this. And where do I find my MAC address? If you do IP config all, your MAC address is your physical address here, which is probably different than mine. You can go ahead and write that down. So in security, we use Mac and IPs, right? We have to make sure we know how to do that to find the information. Any question? So after we install, we need to run command prompt and find Mac and IP addresses by doing IP config all, IP config space slash all. Question. Okay, so once we have everybody finished installing, it's still going? Okay, I'll wait. Okay, and then if you finish installing, you can open up your command prompt and do IP config space slash all. The, and when it sees a different version, it works better with the older version because these tools are old, but they, they do maintain the, the stability of it. So, right, if it's not broken, they're not going to fix it. So, the reason why I choose to use a virtual machine is because if you do scan against our CCD system, their security system will pick it up, right? So that's why we we want to use the it can pick up the virtual machine as well, but you know, but this lab is actually isolated from the rest of the actual network. It's going through VLAN. So all right. Any question? If you are more ahead, you can proceed. Okay. Now if you're using Linux, all you have to do is if you're using Kali and Map is already there. If you're using like Ubuntu or other releases, you just need to install it. So you would do like, for example, I'm using Ubuntu, I would say sudo app get install nmap and it would run the installation. But it, we, would, we would not have the graphical user interface like what we see in Windows, right? Because ZenMap is the, the graphical version of it. nmap is only command line. 
okay? So you can run and map in command line. Okay. So as some of you are finishing, I wanted to preview this so when you get there, you know what to do. So when I'm done installing, I'm gonna close my command prompt here after I got my IP address. Let's close the browser. Oh. And we are gonna open up the Nmap GUI or Zenmap. Okay, so it looks like this, okay? So for the target, you can put in your IP address. So mine was 10.0.2.15. If you don't know your own IP, you can use the loopback address, which is 127.0.0.1, okay? So you always wanna start with specifying what the target would be. And then after that, you can choose the type of scan that you want. But notice here that it is a, a command that you can use in command line with nmap. So if I use this on command line, I have to, to type it like this, nmap-t4-ab-v, which is the option for verbose and the IP address. Okay, so they show you how you can use this command in command line, or you can just use the interface. So here, right, after I put in my IP, I'm gonna choose a quick scan. Where do I do that? Right here at the drop down menu, I'm gonna choose quick scan. And then I just click scan. So the difference between intensive scan and the quick scan is that it's going to ping, the quick scan pings less port. Whenever that you run Nmap, it uses ICMP message, which is used for ping, and it's going to ping against the system. If the system responds to the ping that for a certain port, then it's going to know that that port is open. If the system doesn't respond for a certain port, it's going to either put it into closed or unfiltered. Okay, that's how it can tell what ports are open. So this is it, this works mostly as a port scanner, but it does give you more about what kind of operating system your target is. So if I'm doing a blind testing, I don't know, I don't know who, what kind of system they have on the other end. I can do is I can pay, I can use Zenmap or Nmap and scan against the target, and I will be able to get a little bit more information about that target. What, how many ports are open? What kind of operating system it has? Um, you know, how many hops or how many routers between me and that target? So think of it like from a human standpoint, right? Like if I'm a bank robber, I'm gonna look at the bank, right? How far am I? from that bank? How many streets do I have to drive before I get there? Do I have to go through a gate? What kind of things they have inside? So in information gathering or reconnaissance, in pen testing, this is where we start, okay? We would start by looking at what kind of network that they're using, what kind of ports that they're open to or the services that they have. So after you have the quick scan, okay? Or when you run the quick scan, it's going to show you, right, what kind of command that you're using, which is here, okay? And then it's also going to show you how many ports are open and which are the ports. So when you look at this, it highlights it in green for you here, okay? So it tells me that I'm... I have three things that are open, okay? And if you know your protocol, you would know what kind of services and system they are, okay? NetBIOS is Windows-based. That's the legacy protocol. And then it tells you there, Microsoft DS, right? So you know, oh, my target is Microsoft, right? It also tells you, so here it tells me that I can, one IP address that takes 
it's 17 seconds. So this is a quick scan, okay? Now on top of that, you would see how many ports that are closed. So there are two categories in, in protocol, either UDP or TCP, right? Like HTTP falls under TCP, some protocol falls under both. So on these scans, you can scan TCP only or both or everything. Okay. All right. So after that, you can click on the port and host tab. You would it would list your open ports. Now topology, this is how it maps. Remember, we talked about how far you are from the bank if you wanted to take it down, right? This is how far we are. So it's saying that we are, here's my local host, here's my target, right? So the system sees itself as an individual thing when you're scanning another IP, even though it's scanning itself. So it's fairly close, right? It's saying it's one step. But when you're seeing a larger network and it's connecting through multiple hops and routers, it's gonna map it out for you, okay? It's gonna say, this is the, the number of networks that you have to get to to get to that target. Okay, so topology just means that it's going to give you a layout of, of the source and the destination systems. And then if you want host details, it will tell you here. Now, on the quick scan, you're not going to get the OS information. Okay. So for me, I have three ports that are open, right? And the ports, it lists the ports on the output for you. Those are the ports. Now, if you scan at home, that's going to be different, right? Somewhat close, but different. So every system can be having different ports that are open, depending on the services that's running on that system. So remember, ports are always related to protocol, which are related to services. All right, next. And so when we look through the tab, we can look at the open ports. So how many systems are mapped on the network? It sees the local host and the target. So it looks at itself as two, but though even though we're using the same computer, right? So when you put in a target, because it is itself, it still sees it as another individual system. Now, from the next part, we are gonna do an intent scan. So you just change that here. Okay. And then you start. Now on the intent scan, notice that the The command is really somewhat close, right? It's the same. The four point, yes, hi. Okay, so on the intense scan, when you do scan <coughs> that, it's going to take a few more minutes. Yeah, right. 
Okay, so intense scan. Intense scan takes a little longer. If you notice on the intense scan, right? I actually, it's gonna scan against more ports, right? So it's gonna look at the larger port scope, okay? And on here, remember how we looked at the NSE earlier, which are your, your NMAP scripting engine? On the intense scan, it ran more scripts, okay? compared to a quick scan where it ran only one script on, or even not even that, right? So if you want to run more scripts, then you would use intense scan. And then on the, the ports are gonna be the same because it's the same system that we're scanning. Topology, you should have this. Your host details, it's gonna pick it up on the intense scan. It's gonna tell you that you're running Microsoft this version. 
Okay. Now, if, if it's a Cisco technology, you will see it, or if it's, um, you know, another type of system OS, it would, would tell you. If it can't identify it, it will also list that. So on the intent scan, we're looking at 10,000 ports instead of, uh, I'm sorry, 1,000 ports instead of, you know, earlier, it's a lot less. And then every scan that you do, it would store it here. But we haven't saved it, okay? So you can actually save each of your scans so you can go back to it and study it or report it later. Okay, so as you go through that, answer the questions. I forgot the question mark on this one. Okay, and then What I also wanted to show you was to do a trace route. Now, ideally, you can do this against a domain, right? Uh, that was my original plan, but you know, avoiding additional steps to reconfigure some of the things. So, if you run this on your home computer, you can actually check out, like you know, like scanme.nmap.org. Only scan the domain that's allowable. Okay, don't start scanning the domain that, <laughs> that's not. Okay, so, so go to, so on here, what we can do is we can do like a quick trace route, okay? And then if we wanted to trace that, it's really quick. So it's gonna be like a second or two, okay? Oh, sorry, I forgot to fix this. This is not, it's gonna give you an error. It cannot be connected. Okay, put in your IP address for this one. Yeah, like this Nmap has a sec, uh, uh, their domain, part of their domain you can scan against because that's what the tool is designed to do. So the creators, the two creators for Nmap, they, they put up a location. So whenever my students in, in Python class, when they run the script, that's where we normally test it or, you know, hack this site dot, uh, or, dot org, right? Uh, things like that. So you can use the IP address instead for the trace route.
uses ping so if it's respawn then it's up okay so as you go through that you would see experience different things so on step 37 just don't use the scan me use your ip okay or 127 Any questions regarding Nmap? All right. So I think some of you are already kind of ahead. So when you're looking at your reports, okay, um, topology, we talked about that, your host detail, your state, it's going to show here at the top, right? The list of ports. So this gives you the summary and then the target information and the OS, okay? If you click the plus sign for the port use, it's giving you the, the report, like what you're seeing with port and host. And then, you know, there's no comment, so. And if you did more than one scan, it also lists that there. Let me close this one. Okay, so. The last part for the end map was just the trace route. So you're going to do a quick trace route. And when you use trace route, all that is, is it's going to follow your traffic from your system to the target system. And as it does that, it also uses ICSP, which is a message that we can echo and reply. So it's going to ping all the, the in between. Excuse me. So your, when you look at the command, it's slightly different than your other scan. So every scan, you know, you can put in the options to make it a specific way. And then when you look at the result, you just answer these questions. Okay. So you should get Windows 10 for the OS. You should have the same number of ports that are, or, you know, the number of ports that are scanned. So where can I see that? Right. Um, scan ports. Right on the the quick trace route, it's only going to do those three ports because those are open for it to follow or connect. Question. All right. So I have about nineteen minutes. I'm going to hit GP Edit real quick. Okay. 
And if you finish it today, you don't have to worry about homework for spring break. Remember, no class next week. Okay. Spring break. Yay. I am excited for that too. <laughs> but I'm trying to get all my work for this week done before I go on spring break so I can go on spring break. All right. Okay, so if you're done with Nmap, you're gonna go to GP Edit. This is called Group Policy Editor for your local groups. Okay, some of you are familiar with this. This is used to set up your rules in your system. Okay, anytime that you hear the word policy and security, they just mean applying rules. Okay, so when you get here, after you search for GP Edit, like the instruction said, you're gonna to go to computer configuration. Under that, you're gonna click Windows settings, right? And you can click the arrow next to it. It's gonna give you the drop down, like this. And then security settings. Everything that we need to configure the system is under security Windows settings for Windows system. And then you are gonna to go to account policy. Okay. Account policy allows you to set up how you want the user to use their passwords and if they are using it incorrectly, how you want it to lock out, okay? So under that, you can click and expand on each and on the right side, this is where you configure, okay? So here I can enforce, right? So let's go to uh, password history first. I mean, password policy first. So I can enforce by right clicking enforcing pol policy, click property, and then here I can set. So, you know, those websites that don't allow you to reuse your old password, that's what they set on their server, okay? Now, this is on Windows 10, bless you, but you can set this on server, right? Like server 2019. So if I want the user to not use the last five password, I just put five apply and okay now the minimum is fine right if you set the minimum that means that they have to use that password for at least a certain day that's okay what if they they set it and they forget it in 30 minutes right we can leave the minimum alone we're going to use the maximum how long can they use their password you don't want people to use password forever the same password so I normally go for a few months. So when you, you can right click maximum, go here, and then you can put um, 90 days. That gives us three months. Okay. Apply and okay. So on the steps, it shows you how you can go through this. And then if you want them to use the length, how long is the password? You can go here, go to the link, and then set that. So by default, you can see that Windows doesn't require that. But once you set that, the user have to follow those rules once it's applied. So if it's eight character, you just put in eight, at least eight. Some company would require 12 or 14. I'm actually using a blockchain uh, thing for your batches and they require 14 and up characters for their, for their um, authentication. Okay, then click okay. Now, if you want complex password, that's the next one. All you have to do is enable it. Apply and okay. And then we don't really need to change this, but you can, um, it should be left disabled. All right, the next is account policy. This is where you can lock people out if they're using the wrong password. So this is where we can do, we can prevent brute force right here is underneath that. So on here, you have to set the threshold before you set the duration, okay? I know they put it in the second option. That's a design issue. I always look at software and I'm like, what is the flaw on this? All right, click, right click, okay? So if they use five wrong password, we can put in five. They need to lock out for a certain amount of time. 
let's be realistic about this, right? Do you want to get them to lock out for 24 hours? Most financial company, they do that, right? So they can investigate. But in realistically, on the regular environment, normally it locks them out for an hour or more, like two hours or three hours. Because if you lock people out from work, just think about it. I come back from lunch. I'm tired, right? I, I want to get my work done. I log in. I forgot my password, right? Do you want me to wait three hours for my lunch time and not do anything, right? Or they're going to have to call tech support. So normally they would lock you out for an hour and then you have to call tech support during that time. So we can lock them out after five times, okay? And then it's going to tell you the duration. You can click OK. Change your duration to, I, have, I think you have, I have you do 180 minutes, but you can do 90 minutes, 60 minutes. Most companies now, I think they do 24 hours and then you have to reset your password or contact them, okay? So on this step right here, I have you set for five invalid login, 180 minutes, and then they can reset their password after an hour, okay? So apply, okay, and then for um, reset account, we can have them reset on their own after an hour. Now, if it's a web-based type of system, waiting an hour sometimes makes sense if it's highly sensitive or sensitive. Sometimes they need to wait 24 hours to reset. I know I use Citibank and when you forget your password, right? Or if you have invalid login, one time I had to wait 24 hours to reset. So, you know, but that's really up to, you know, how, what you want to use your, your account for. So here we can do 60 minutes. So they have to wait an hour before they can reset their password. And that's fair. I think, you know, they can go get coffee and catch up with other things. <laughs> which is usually the case, or usually they send you a ticket and you, you as, a, as a technician or an administrator, you can reset it right away, right? You just go to their account, right click their account, reset password, and then there you go, right? But for them, if they need to reset it online or on their own, they have to wait an hour. Okay. So after that, right? That's it for today. But I wanted to talk to you about this, okay? There are a lot other things that's going on here. If you want to learn more about Windows configurations and setup, summer, we are gonna run CIS 40C. That's part of the IT specialist certificate under the apprenticeship program. Mr. Anderson is teaching that, okay, online, okay? And we're gonna try to run it again in the fall in case it gets canceled in the summer. <laughs> and then for, since most of you didn't hear this last time, but I am teaching CIS 40A. So if you want to expand your network plus skill, which you should, the same time as this class. Yes. Uh, are you teaching that in the fall? Yes. Okay. So in the fall, it's gonna be Monday and Wednesday, four, uh, three to uh, a little longer like close to five o'clock because it's two hours for the regular class each. And after that, there's a break and I'm teaching CIS 27A forensic after an hour after that. So from six to eight and it's in this room, okay? So the, the, the reason why is I want for the students to come on campus on one day and they're able to tackle other classes, okay? And then CIS 27 is gonna be run online again, but Mr. Lawyer is gonna teach it um, as I already have five classes. So, so make sure that if you're interested in learning about Windows, you can take CIS 40C. You should take 40A next semester in the fall, okay? Because without that class, you might run into issues with the prerequisite down the line. 26A is only at RCC. If you're an RCC student and you're in the apprenticeship program there, you, you can take 26A, B, C, D, and they have a separate certificate, a little different than us. Yeah. 
okay? Um, and also, if you want to start working as an apprentice, if you're ready and you took 25, work experience 200 will run in the fall and I'm teaching that online. So we can prep your resume and get you ready to do the practice test. And also, hopefully in a week or so, I will be able to get your certification voucher. But that opens for the apprenticeship student, okay? So if you haven't registered for apprenticeship, do it. It takes three forms. It's free tuition. You get a bunch of free stuff and you can get a job. So, all right. If we're done, shut down our window system. If you're not done today, you can stick around for a little bit, but I do have a five o'clock class. Uh, and then when you come back, if you want to come in a little early, I'll be here so you can pack up with your lab. Get your work done this week and submit. Okay. So you don't have, um, you know, I will pack up with your grading. So you don't have homework over the spring break. But if you want to do work over the spring break, you can. Okay. School will be closed next week, but we will be back the following Monday. So. When we come back, I will open up your practice test for Security Plus, and that's also a requirement for this class is to get you to practice. Okay, have a good one. And if those of you who compete in the NCL game, individual game starts next week. Okay, so if you if you want to compete, I still have two tokens left that I paid for that's not being used. So I, I like for you to at least try it, but you won't have access to gymnasium anymore. If you do, you can practice while you're competing. Okay. If you want a polo shirt for NCL, for those of you who are in the team, Bose's team, right, Black Star, that's your name, uh, you can go down to the makerspace. You can make your own polo, or you can ask one of the uh, Irene or Cynthia to help you. Uh, get one of the polos. I bought white polo shirts. Thank you, Trevor. Yeah, have a good one. And enjoy your weekend. Great. Yay. Long waited for. Make sure we remove our USB, yours and the school, and then shut down this computer. And yeah, grab some snacks. Have a good one. Fun. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. I can do that. Okay. Oh. to install it. Yeah. I'll stop recording.